Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's pray together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul the Great, pray for us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, this past summer, I had the blessing of leading a pilgrimage over to the Holy Land. And one of the joys of doing this is getting to see the images that you hear in Scripture come to life. And so I'm going to show up just a couple of the images see what uh, I'm talking about. This, this is Nazareth to the right up on the hill. Our Lady would have walked down through that valley across those plains to visit Elizabeth. You see it. It comes to life. Next one here, this is the Mount of Beatitudes where Christ, blessed are the pure in heart, they're going to see God. You got the Sea of Galilee in the background. Next slide, what we're looking at here, this is the Valley of the Shadow of Death, spoken about in the Psalms. This is also the part spoken about in the story of the Good Samaritan. I think we even have a little video of the beauty of the Sea of Galilee. So if you can uh, play that video, give them an idea what the Sea of Galilee would look like. Uh, we got that video? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we walk. You know, we lost one. But it's all good. We had extras. Uh, and so, but the next image I want to show you is the one I really want to dwell on. Uh, what we're looking at here, um, this is Caesarea Philippi. This is the place where Christ brought his apostles to tell Peter, you are Peter, on this rock, I'll build my church, the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And I had always learned in theology class that, hey, up in Capernaum was this really big rock. You know, so Jesus went up there, and I thought, oh, it's kind of cool, he's got that visual aid. Um, but there were bigger rocks in Capernaum, like up and around Galilee. Why would he go take a 37-mile hike to get to this rock? This isn't just a rock. This was an active demonic temple that he brought them to. What we're looking at here is the ancient temple of the Greek god Pan. That's the kind of the creepy guy with the goat legs and the goat horns and all that stuff. This is basically his home. What we've got going on at the time of Christ was active demonic. They had animal sacrifice, bestiality, human sacrifice. So Christ brings his apostles there. Which is like, what, what are you doing? Like, that's like me bringing like focused missionaries to like the red light district in Amsterdam to give them a chastity training. Like, what, what, what are you thinking? Well, he shows up at the house of a demon and says, I'm starting a church. I mean, talk about boss move. And for those of you, historical buffs, what's interesting, there's an ancient Greek historian who was writing before Christians even showed up in Greece and said, at this time in history, Greek sailors showed up at the shores of Greece saying they had seen a vision out at sea, and they said, we saw a vision. The great god Pan is dead, and it was met with mourning and lamentation among the Greeks. This was decades before a Christian even set foot on Greek soil. They had sensed something had shifted, something had been overthrown. And at this rock, you know, there were niches in the wall where they'd offer sacrifice. At the top of the rock was an actual temple to the god Pan. And you imagine our Lord standing in front of all of this, and the big the cave there you see, the Greeks believed this was the portal to the netherworld. This was the gate of Hades, the gate of hell. And he stands in front of all of this, and he says, you, Peter, are rock, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And what I would propose this morning is for your entire life, you have heard that pa passage backwards. What you have heard is that hell will never prevail against the gates of the church. It's not what that says. It says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. What's the distinction? I want you to think about this. Gates are defensive structures. Nobody gets attacked by a gate. I mean, show of hands, like how many of you have ever been attacked by a gate? Okay, that's actually more than I had anticipated, but uh, I'm gonna <laughs> stick with the main point here. You don't get attacked by a gate. You storm the gate. And I say this because like, I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of this narrative. The church is under attack. The church is under attack. The church, cut it out. Look, look, I get it. There's going to be battles. Church is under attack. I got invited to speak in Ireland. I started getting messages on social media. If you come here, <laughs> sorry, they said, if you come here, we're going to boil you in a cauldron. I was getting, I'm like, man, don't throw shade. I'm Irish, man. You can't do that. Uh, 
I went to Alaska, uh, give a talk at a parish. The night before the presentation, uh, vandals came to the church, spray painted with red spray paint, graphic sexual imagery all over the parish. And the, the pastor, I like it, he took it in stride. He told the parish, he said, you know what? In uh, preparation for this talk on theology of the body, I had commissioned some frescoes for the parish. And you know, <laughs> It didn't quite turn out as we had hoped, so we'll have the Knights of Columbus paint over that, so don't even worry about that. But yeah, the, the, look, yeah, I, I get it. The church is under the attack. Church is under attack. But you know what? Thinking the church is under attack, th that's literally like watching Jurassic Park. And like there's some Tyrannosaurus Rex chasing some guy through the jungle at night, and he like throws a flashlight at it, and you're like, ooh, the dinosaur is under attack. And it's like backwards, my friends. Look at the way Christ looked at this. He said, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first bind the strong man, and then indeed he may plunder his house. The strong man is Satan, but one stronger than him has come, has binded him up, and is now plundering his house, meaning the kingdom of darkness. What is God plundering? He's redeeming what's his his children, he's taking them back and restoring them. The church is the one on the march. The church is the one on the offensive. And so not only do we get the sense that the church is marching forward in this victory, and yeah, there's gonna be persecutions, but it's urgent. Remember the Gospel of John? It says, the harvest, behold, it's ripe. It's a poor translation. The Greek does not say the harvest is ripe. When a harvest is ripe, it's golden. The Greek says the harvest is white, lukai. When a harvest turns white, apparently that means it's about to die unless it's harvested immediately, the whole crop will be lost. This sense of urgency. And I know at this point at Seek, Focus had asked me, now this is the talk, we're going to send them out on mission to just go out and evangelize. Um, but I'm, I'm actually not going to do that. I decided recently, and I'm sure Curtis sit back, no, no, just stick with the plan, Jason, stick with the plan. Um, well, I want Curtis to think of this like a plot twist, right? Like every movie has a good plot twist. Well, <laughs> Why? Why would I do this to my good friends at Seek? Uh, well, the reason I'm doing this to them is because of one, one quote I came across from St. John of the Cross a few weeks ago that completely wrecked my preparation for this presentation. I'm going to put this on the screen because I want you to see it with your eyes. I want you to hear it with your ears. This is what St. John of the Cross said. Let those then who are singularly active, who think they can win the world with their preaching and exterior works, Observe here that they would profit the church and please God much more, not to mention the good example they would give, were they to spend at least half of this time with God in prayer. They would then certainly accomplish more and with less labor by one work than they otherwise would by a thousand, for through their prayer they would merit this result and themselves be spiritually strengthened. Without prayer, they would do a great deal of hammering but accomplish little, and sometimes nothing, and even sometimes cause harm. This hits home for me, because sometimes they'll say to God, like, God, this year, I want to speak to a million people. And they'll say, okay, like, would you like to fast for a million people? And I'm like, ah, like, fasting makes me hungry. Like, you know, can I have, like, you know, like, maybe a microphone and a sandwich in the green room? Uh, no, no. In fact, I remember one priest, he said this, hyperactivity and the apostolic life is a sign of spiritual laziness. I'm gonna run that by again. Hyperactivity in the apostolic or the ministry life is actually a mark, a sign of spiritual laziness. Like, what do you mean? I thought that's what you're supposed to do. Well, it is what we do. Why laziness? It's because the heavy lifting is done in the interior life. And this is modeled to us by St. John Paul the Great. And I know he passed away, but while some of you were as young as preschool, didn't get a chance to know this guy. This man, for one, he had a staggering intellect. He delivered his first homily as Pope in 11 different languages. His secretary confirmed he had the gift of split concentration, meaning he could read a dense book of theology while someone else was reading to him aloud a book in philosophy, and he would absorb both sources simultaneously. He could write papal speeches while someone else was teaching him a foreign language, and he would absorb both sources. Now, what some people don't know in the church is that I, too, am developing this gift of split concentration. I can, no, I can actually watch an, like an NBA basketball game while my wife is explaining to me the schedule for the kids for the next day, and I can... I can kind of like resorb like both sources simultaneously. And like you laugh, but like she'll quiz me. She'll like, 
what did I just say? I'm like, you just said that like LeBron is like two rebounds away from getting a triple double. I was just like, that's not what I said. I'm like, well, that's why we practice these things, okay? Like we're gonna, but legit. But JP too, he had this gift, but he was so down to earth. Soon after becoming Pope, he was walking through the Vatican Gardens, and there was a landscaper there who he hadn't met yet. And the guy's out there like fixing sprinklers or pulling up weeds, his hands were filthy with mud and dirt, and John Paul walked, oh, I haven't met you before, walks up to him, and the guy can't shake the Pope's hands, his hands are full of mud. John Paul grabs him by the wrist, pulls his muddy hands, smears them on his white papal cassock, and says, don't worry, now that I'm the Pope, I don't have to do my laundry anymore. <laughs> it's like, I like this guy, right? Like, he had like this magnetism about him. And I've lost count of how many people I've spoken to who said, oh yeah, like I came to town when John Paul was there and I brought my uncle who's like atheist, fell away from the church, agnostic, whatever. And it, you know, Pope's coming in and you know, my uncle's like, I don't get the big deal. He's just some man. Pope goes by in the Pope mobile. Next thing, looks down, his uncle's on the ground on his knees, just crying in a moment of conversion. And it is inspirational as that is, I don't know how, practical it is for us. I mean, the only way that I could get one of you to fall to your knees on, in crying if I drove by you would be if I, like, I, I physically hit you with my car. I mean, that's the only <laughs> way that that's going to take place. But what can we gain from him? Well, I, I think of his magnetism. The word magnet. You remember that like fifth grade science experiment you did where you take like a steel nail, you touch it to staples, nothing happens. Then you pull the nail away, and then you rub a strong magnet on it, you magnetize the steel, bring it back to the staples, and pff, they cling to it. To me, that was an image of John Paul. He had lived such a deep interior life with Christ, the beauty to which we are all drawn, that when he goes out of prayer and into the world, we're immediately drawn to the beauty we see in him. Look at what he said. He said, in order to do in your church, also in the field of the new evangelization that's urgently needed, we must first learn to be, that is to stay with you in your sweet company and adoration. Because were we to disregard the Eucharist, how could we overcome our own deficiency? Mother Teresa lived this. In fact, she told her sisters, you need to pray a holy hour every single day. Some of the sisters approached her and said, Mother, with all the needs of the poor here in Calcutta, we don't quite have time for a, the whole holy hour. And she said, I understand. If you don't have time for one holy hour, I want you to do two holy hours instead. And she doubled their time if they didn't think they had time for prayer. Because as I see it, the most important field of evangelization that God has entrusted to you is your own soul. He's so much more interested in our conversion than in using us to convert other people. In fact, I read a priest just like two weeks ago. He said, be careful not to confuse enthusiasm for a virtue with the acquisition of that virtue. Meaning, I can stand up here all day and talk to you about faith that can move mountains, but do I really, on a daily basis, know how to surrender to the providence of God the smallest things in my own life that are beyond my control? I can stand up here and wax eloquent about redemptive suffering, but then I like, get a splinter and I'm like questioning the existence of God. You know, and I'm you know, like, God, if you're all powerful, how come I'm not getting what I want? Like, I don't understand. You know, and I can talk about chastity all day, but honestly, how well have I mastered the movements of my own heart? And so John Paul draws us into this interior life. And he's not drawing us into passivity, not at all. This was not a passive man. This guy brought the gospel to 129 countries. Do the math. That means he traveled the distance from here to the moon three times. They used to joke in the Vatican. They said, yeah, what's the difference between God and Pope John Paul II? God is in all places, but the Pope has already been there. So this guy... <laughs> was not passive, but, but he knew when he would go on these trips that there was a primacy of listening above speaking. A perfect example, a summer's night in Paris in 1980. He shows up at a stadium with 50,000 young people. It filled the capacity, 35,000 more teens outside just wanting to listen to him. And instead of lecturing them, he gave them three hours to ask him whatever questions they want. And he just sat up there and listened to the young people saying, what you have to say to me is more important than what I have to say to you. And you'd answer their questions. But in the middle of this, some teenager unscripted gets into line and he gets to the microphone and he starts questioning John Paul about his belief in God. He was doing it respectfully, but very pointedly, and it was not planned. The MC took control of the situation and moved on to the other questions. 
John Paul had no opportunity to answer the boy. The Holy Father went back to Rome and he kept thinking about this young man that is, he was so troubled his question wasn't answered. So John Paul reaches out to Cardinal Francois Marty, who was the Cardinal Ar Archbishop of Paris at the time, who hosted the event. And he asked Cardinal Marty, would you please find the boy? <laughs> I'm sure Cardinal Marty's like, there's 85,000 teenagers and you want me to find the boy. But when <laughs> John Paul asks you to find the boy, you find the boy. And so he starts asking around, do you know what parish that kid was with, what church brought that? And they found the boy. John Paul wrote him a personal letter apologizing to him that his important question was not asked and flew the boy to the Vatican so the two of them could have lunch and talk and listen about his questions about God. This is the heart that he had, the primacy of listening over speaking, the primacy of the interior life over the exterior life. He showed it to us. That's what made him such a great evangelist. How do we model this? Well, I think a friend of mine does. He told me once that he is doing, gay, he does evangelization in gay and lesbian bars in Chicago. And when he first told me that, I'm like, wow, you must be a real popular guy, just kind of like bringing a catechism into a lesbian bar. And, and he's like, no, we don't do that. And I'm like, I know, but like, how do you evangelize? And he's like, oh, we just talk about the Cubs, the White Sox, the Bears, the weather, stuff like that. I'm like, I know, but like the small talk, but how do you talk about God? And he said, well, a lot of time we don't. And I'm like, well, how is this evangelization? And he said, look, I've been doing this for three years. And he said, I have gay male prostitutes calling my cell phone at three o'clock in the morning when they want to commit suicide because they know I'm a really good listener. So he said, look, you don't always have to be the mouth of Christ. Sometimes you're just supposed to be his ears. And so as we're so tempted, yeah, I mean, amen to what that guy's doing. I mean, God bless him. And so, but, but when we do this, when we take this right approach, of being before doing, of listening, and we're just in the zone where God wants us to be, miracles happen. And I'll leave with you the last story from John Paul II. This is one I'd never found before this last summer. I was in Wadowice, his, his birthplace in Poland, and I found the testimony of a college-aged girl whose life was changed by this man. Soon after becoming a priest, he was assigned to the second parish assignment at St. Florian's Parish outside the heart of Krakow. This was a part of town bustling with university students, young families, intellectuals. And I read about this girl, and she was coming home from class, and this is what happened to her. She said, I was coming back from class on a hot afternoon, and I entered St. Florian's church to rest in the coolness inside. And then I heard a rustle of sheets of paper. I looked back. A priest was sitting in the confessional on the right and reading something under a small lamp. I don't know how it happened that I went. I knew that I needed to go, and I knelt in the confessional. And then there was the confession, unlike all the ones I've gone to before. Something in me broke. I understood that I could not live like that anymore, that I had to begin to have an inner life, that I had to want something, desire something, that I had to start talking with God and learn to listen to what he was saying as well. I can still hear the words the priest whispered at the end, come again. And so this week, if something broke in you, John Paul whispers to you, come again. Not just come again to seek 2024, come again to the sacrament. Come again to that place where you heard his voice this week, in the quiet of Eucharistic adoration, listening to speakers, reading the scriptures, come again. Because instead of our march to just go out, the Holy Father is calling us to go in. Not to use the mouth so much the ears, and not so much to do, but to be. Because what the church needs right now more than anything is not better arguments, more seminars, more speakers, more projects, more programs. The church only needs one more thing, and that is more saints. And this is why the Holy Father said to us, and I leave you with these words, do not be afraid to be the saints of the new millennium, so that in this world that passes away, you shall be prophets of a world that does not die. God bless you.